into my class. Uh, we have a class about, um, in English it's the, land, the religious landscape of Jerusalem, um, and uh, part of the landscape is of course the Muslim landscape. Um, I actually, my, my background is uh, that I come from Germany, I studied Arabic studies and theology, back in Germany, did my PhD about Quranic studies um, and then came here to Jerusalem for postdoc and somehow ended up as a lecturer. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for um, coming and thank you for my students that uh, you made all the way here. And I just start because uh, I didn't talk the lecture through so my it will be too long. It will, you know, and so we we'll see how. And, and when I see that you get tired, that um, I'll stop and uh, um, we'll, um, go into questions and answers. Um, what brought my attention actually to uh, sensory experience? So the senses, taste, smell, touch, um, is something that you know I studied. Um, Holy scriptures and texts, usually as texts, uh, and also religions through texts, uh, and not through practices, uh, and through rituals and rites. Uh, and lately I started to really get interested in that. And, and I had one course at university, it was called Census in Islam. Um, and when I gave it, a student of mine, a Palestinian student, came to me. And, and she said, said, did you actually know that, you know, the Dome of the Rock, we do have this place where people put their hand inside and they, and, and then they take it out, they smell it, and they smell the uh, scent, the, the scent of paradise. Uh, I know I don't believe in that, but you know, the people, they do it. And, and I was a bit, uh, I have to say, uh, although I went there uh, several times, this never actually appeared to me, and I never took uh, attention, um, because usually um, when I enter the Dome of the Rock, I'm dazzled by the beauty, and my eyes go up to the mosaics, to the inscription, um, uh, knowing that this is one of the earliest Islamic landscapes that we have, that was built in the early Umayyad period by Abdel Malik, uh, finished in 692, and it had, uh, has one of the earliest um, written attestations of the Quranic text that this, you know, from my academic background, usually would interest me. And so I didn't look down, um, but uh, I wanted to bring you also the, the, the beauty of this building, which is also a sensory experience, right? That you look at something and you find it so beautiful. And although the whole space uh, changed over the centuries, so there's still um, uh, a lot. Uh, of the parts that are still original um, and they're still valid, what Ibn Battuta said. And Ibn Battuta was a Muslim traveler in the 14th century and he also came to Jerusalem and he said about the Dome of the Rock, that quote, the Dome of the Rock, can you actually hear me well now? The Dome of the Rock is a building of extraordinary beauty, solidity, elegance, and singularity of shape, both outside and inside. The decoration is so magnificent and the workmanship so surpassing as to defy description. The greater part is covered with gold so that the eyes, one who gazes on its beauties, are dazzled by its brilliance, now glowing like a mass of light, now flashing like lightning. But indeed, there is this place that the student mentioned. Uh, it's in the northwestern corner of the, the uh, inside the dome and from the, on the rock. Um, and it's, as you can see, it's an Ottoman structure. Um, and you can see there is actually an opening where you could put uh, your hand inside. Uh, and the stone itself is actually, it's made a bit like mask or rumba. Um, now, the guards who are inside the dome of the rock, they would uh, be very much attentive to what you're doing. And they would say, of course, this is us. We are doing that. We are anointing that. Um, there's nothing supernatural about it. Um, and it might be or might not be that there's also the footprint of the prophet. But still, they, they try to, you know, to take 
uh, as much as possible back of, um, of this kind of sensory experience that you might have by touch and by smell. However, also when I was there, so the people came, they pray, they touch, uh, and they ask for blessings. Interestingly enough, there is a scholar, Adam Bursi, um, he's a um, US American uh, scholar for early Islam, and he published recently an article that is called uh, The Sense of Space, Early Islamic Pilgrimage, Parfum, and Paradise. And he examined actually the importance of sensory experience uh, at pilgrimage sites such as Jerusalem. So, and he argued that actually the prominence of pleasing aromas at sacred spaces such as Jerusalem is connected to the Islamic idea about the proximity of paradise to these sites. According to literary traditions dating back to the late Umayyad period, so that's the uh, 8th century, the dome's attendants, so the servants, or the, the ones who worked here, covered the entire rock, so you see the rock in the middle, um, uh, in Arabic it's the Zahra, twice weekly on Mondays and Thursdays in a perfume made from musk, umbergers, zahra, and other luxurious materials. Before circumambulating, so going around, the stone with senses with burn, burning scented wood. When these rituals were completed, the curtains uh, that actually would cover the gates uh, of the dome would be raised and the smoke would billow out of the, of the dome of the rock and an announcement was made. The Sakhra is now open for the people. Whoever wants to pray therein, let them come. So visitors would rush to pray within the space and after that, they would uh, very much smell by the scent. And people would be called, this is the one uh, of those who have entered the Sahra. So it was very much uh, known at that time that whoever went there and prayed had this specific smell. Now, it's not certain when this ritual uh, ceased, uh, but fragrances, especially musk and amber, are still used in mosques. Uh, maybe not as heavenly also as in, uh, as in churches, but still also in the Dome of the Rock, in the Kibli Mosque, or in uh, Al-Aqsa, there is a kind of sweet scent. So what does that mean? Does it, is, it something, um, uh, is it something conveyed that maybe uh, was taken from Christian traditions, or is there a specific uh, meaning to it? The Quran and later Islamic literature actually displayed a very pronounced emphasis on the olfactory aspect of afterlife. So what does that mean? That means that the paradise, the gardens, the jannat, um, of paradise, there is musk in it, umbergus, camphor, saffron, and that this all plays a big role. So the Quran, for example, mentions that the blessed inhabitants of paradise Drink pure water mixed with camphor, ginger, as well as wine sealed with musk. And early hadith, so this is the traditions that go back to the Prophet, describe the soil of paradise as composed of saffron and musk. And blessed inhabitants excuse uh, or smell like musk and not like soil. So, hence the sense they cre create a moment of paradisia. So, being knowledgeable now uh, about the description of paradise in the Quran and also in Hadith, uh, the mosaics that we find now around inside the Dome of the Rock uh, also help to get a kind of feeling of, you know, uh, feeling elevated to paradise or somehow rather paradise also ascend, uh, descending to us. The motifs that you can find there. Um, uh, as art historians like Ole Kaba or like Khemis and others show evoke paradise. We have, and you can see that the picture of certain plants, uh, of fruits, and very precious stones, uh, and they all mirror uh, imagery of paradise. And um, also Christian languages, another um, 
a scholar from the German school in the Netherlands, uh, who's working actually on the census in Islam, uh, he argued actually that the early texts that uh, describe the proximity of paradise at these places, not as something symbolic, not as something just gesturing that there might be something, but um, which is in the moment absent, but he would say actually paradise is truly there. Truly in the dome of the rock, uh, you can experience the sacredness uh, and that relates to paradise. So, um, and also uh, the marble that is at the, at the side of, um, of the, or below the mosaics and also the columns um, might um, reflect the image of uh, rippling water. And George said the marble pen below the mosaics with its wave patterns might have evoked water sliding down from this fantastical garden. A visual impression reinforced by the coolness to the touch. In this reading, the monument offers an almost tactical glimpse of paradise on us. So all this seems to evoke paradise. Now, this is one side. This is the side that you can smell, touch, you can observe. Um, but the proximity of heaven and earth uh, and the spiritual power that is um, ascribed to Jerusalem demands, first of all, explanation. Why here? Why not somewhere else? And it de demands also action. So what you do in such a place if this is so close to paradise or it's maybe already part of paradise? Um, so uh, if you look to the Haram Sharif, so from far. This is now from the university, as you see. Uh, it looks like a planet, uh, uh, like two, just two main um, structures on it, right? The Dome of the Rock uh, in the middle, and then the other one, the Kibli Mosque, or that's also usually called the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, although the whole area actually is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, um, but if you go uh, and come closer, okay, uh, here I uh, take this picture from uh, Pasia, you see all these small dots, right? And all these small dots, every and s a single um, place has a meaning. A meaning uh, that is, for example, uh, connected to a historical past, to a kind of musical past, uh, happened there and also something that's going to happen. So for example in the end of times. So and all so this whole place is full of um, places that demand action and that have their own memory uh, that come there. And also you see around the, the mosque so the whole area is the mosque. Okay so it's not just the two uh, buildings but the whole mosque. Uh, it's also surrounded by a lot of buildings, rivals, uh, uh, these are like um, retreats, almost like tantur or something like that, yeah? And uh, we have uh, madaras, we have madrasas, so uh, religious schools, we have uh, zawiyas, so uh, places where Sufis uh, used to gather. Um, so it's a place full of memory from past, present and also on uh, future. So, and all these parts actually help also to, to, to feel the, the holiness and sacredness of this space. So how do we know about that? So we'll move now to the 13th century. First, now we had a look to what happened uh, in the early, uh, late 7th, early 8th century. In the 13th century, um, we go to the time after Salah uh, defeated the Crusaders, um, and especially in the Mamluk period, in that time, we had, uh, the city was actually a magnet for Muslim pilgrims from all over the world. Um, and actually, when we go into the old city, actually the architecture is uh, mostly Mamluk architecture. So what we have in the old city is uh, kind of the Mamluk city. Uh, and during this time, we have uh, a genre, a literary genre coming up um, that got very 
very famous, that is the genre of uh, pilgrimage guide. And the so-called Fadail al-Quds, so the merits of Jerusalem. Uh, and Al-Quds is um, one name, it can also be um, Bayt al-Maqdis or Bayt al-Quds. Al-Bayt al-Quds, so Bayt al-Maqdis, the house of holiness, or Al-Bayt al-Quds, uh, the sanctified house. Um, and so these, uh, these works are not just guides that help the pilgrim to you know, go through all these points that I pointed out uh, that are on the previous slide. Um, the, they also instructed the pilgrims of the rituals that should be done at the uh, certain points um, with each spot. Also, what lies beyond the walls of the um, uh, of the haram of the mosque, so actually also shared places, or Christian places, what you do, whether you, uh, which kind of churches you might visit or you might not visit. Um, and they also uh, offer a very nice um, view into the sacredness, uh, or the theology of sac uh, sacredness, and also of historiography. Um, so they have their, they are connections of a lot of traditions regarding uh, Jerusalem, um, biblical, about uh, David, about uh, Suleiman, Salomon, about what happened during the time of when Jesus uh, was living um, the, in the Islamic uh, um, period, and so on. So they also help us to understand how they understood history and what in that time was also at stake or what could be seen in, in, in this century. Now, of course, uh, the, the Fatale puts it's all about the sanctity of Jerusalem. So to make sure that everybody understands how important is Jerusalem uh, in Muslim life, and as you might know, uh, especially important is of course the accounts of the prophet's nocturnal um, journey from Mecca to Jerusalem, the uh, Isra, and then the, his ascendance to heaven. Uh, the Miraj that took place in Jerusalem according to traditions. Uh, so that was, of course, uh, of major importance for uh, in Islamic um, in, in Islamic mind and in the Islamic belief. But uh, beyond that, um, we have also other traditions that are connected and that are also important for Muslims um, that uh, relate to the creation. Uh, and the importance of Jerusalem during the creation and the end of the days. Now, we already have these traditions that are then gathered, gathered already very early in the 7th, 8th century, um, but the first really uh, collections appeared in the 9th century. We don't have any um, uh, surviving manuscripts. The first one who wrote was somebody called al Malik um, Ibn Hamad al Ramli, so from Ramla. Um, but he, his uh, work was uh, um, included into other works, and, and uh, the most important one that usually is referred to also in academic articles is the one by Ibn al Muraja al Maqdisi, who was also uh, he lived in Jerusalem, and he wrote uh, Fadai uh, by the Maqdis, and uh, he died in 1047. So, uh, just before the time of the Crusaders. Uh, so, although these first uh, um, Fadail um, works appeared before the Crusaders, they were used also uh, after the regaining of the city by, by Muslim rulers. Um, and after they, uh, they regained control, there was also uh, um, a consciousness that we have to sanctify uh, this place again, and so this kind of genre uh, gained momentum. And I, uh, I uh, will present you with one of it. This is I, uh, what I wrote here. This is by Abdul Rahim Ibn Ali Shaid uh, al Qarashi, uh, who died in 1228. He was, um, as far as we know, he was uh, in the entourage of Salah al Din, who came from Egypt, and he was like an officer going here and there between Egypt and the 
Ban Sham and also stayed in Jerusalem and he had this uh, book which as you see is not for that of foot um, but it has this rhyming um, wonderful uh, title Miftah al maqasid wa Misbah al maqasid fi ziyarat bayt al maqbud so it's even hard to translate for me uh, it's uh, the, the, the key of the objection of what you want to read and the light of Marashid, sorry, it's um, the Marashid uh, of, the, of the goal or something in uh, visiting uh, the um, house of holiness. And um, he starts, ah, and I want to add something because actually we do have so many of these Fadai um, works that not all are yet edited. And this one was edited actually by an MA student from Najah University in Nablus. Uh, uh, by Hatem Dawood and uh, happily I found that one um, because this is something that I think until now is not uh, very well known and it's uh, especially because it's a bit different from what I know to other uh, works because he's very much aware of Christian and uh, Jewish traditions that he also includes. He is, uh, he writes poetry so we do have a lot of poems also inside. Um, and a lot of personal stories. He starts his book um, with the holiness of mosques. He says, and that's I think very interesting, and this is also uh, very interesting to understand uh, why uh, the mosque here, the Laksa mosque, is so uh, important. He says that um, mosques are created to be places of worship, worshiping God, as the same as humans are created to worship God. So he somehow animates the space. He uh, de describes even the Haram al-Sharif, so uh, Temple Mount, the Haram al-Sharif as a human body. And this human body that was created and was sanctified by God um, and needs from time to time also be purified uh, and it can be, you know, corrupted and has to be again uh, brought into a uh, kind of audience. And uh, God, according to Karashi, would uh, honor Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem as uh, in a very specific way that uh, he would create also their lamps of his remembrance, liquor, and he surrounds them also with very specific blessings um, and his angels would be present at these places. Now this is something that uh, he's not he's sharing with uh, actually with a lot of Islamic traditions that go back to the Prophet who would say there are three uh, mosques that uh, you should visit. Uh, this is Mecca, this is uh, my, uh, Medina and uh, Jerusalem. But uh, his way of um, explaining why is uh, up for, for what I know is uh, interesting and maybe human. And the sanctity of Jerusalem is also um, based, of course, in the Quran, and because uh, we do have several verses that say that this, the land itself is blessed. So the land that has been blessed around it. Or uh, So there's a, the Baraka, there is blessing in this land. Hence, the sanctity of this place does not just depend on humans or certain rituals. Actually, the humans are the custodians of this land. And they have to respond to, to the, to the uh, favors that God bestowed here. So, um, so uh, Jerusalem needs to be purified also and uh, taken care of by uh, by the worshippers themselves, by the humans. Now, he gives account of its holiness already in regard uh, to Dawood, David, and Salomon who built uh, the temple here. Um, so therefore, any event in history uh, is always also uh, connected to its initial sanctification by God. So whether it's very critical, it's destruction. So, that, uh, so also that the temple was destructed had, was meaningful uh, for, uh, for him. 
uh, he also takes up um, uh, a tradition that is also well known in Fuji, Christian tradition that Adam is buried. He's buried uh, uh, in, uh, according to his tradition, he has buried his legs next to the rock, in the tomb of the rock, and, and his head in Hebrew. Uh, and at the end of days, God would raise him up, so his feet would be next to the, um, the rock. And so where would uh, the, uh, the judgment take place? It would take place uh, on uh, or next to the uh, rock to the sun. And um, um, he would say, on the day of judgment, God as a will raise Adam on his feet and he will gather all his descendants. So Adam is the first person, uh, the first human, and all his descendants so all humans. For that, the blessed land is also called the land of gathering. So after the Masha, uh, which then has also a lot of uh, traditions. Now, he gives a plenty of awareness to uh, saying that maybe Muslim, Muslims definitely uh, are very well uh, aware of, but usually uh, non-Muslims do not know much about. This is a khidr. Um, a khidr, the green one, uh, is a kind of mystical um, person, a saint. Uh, he appears in the Quran. Uh, he is endowed, according to Islamic tradition, with the mortal life. And he's actually well known for his ability to travel uh, around the world and to perform miracles. And he's very important uh, at also at the sport of Jerusalem. He um, he's important here, and he says his very place is between the gate of mercy, the Bab Rahma, and the gate of Asba, the, the gate, uh, gate of tribes. So. Trust. I'll show that to you. So he said, This is the Bab Rahma here. Uh, I think that's bad. No, no, it's the upper part. It's here, it's huh? Same, no, same line, same line. Here. No, it, it's the small. Up, it's up, up, it's up? Upper, upright, upright. No, this is a this is a bar. Ah, sorry. Here, right? Yeah. Okay, sorry. So it would be, his better place would be somewhere here. Um, and uh, he would pray uh, on Fridays at five mosques Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem, the Qubba uh, Mosque, which is the first mosque that was ever built by the Prophet, and the Mas Masjid at Tur. Um, obviously, there was a very important Masjid at Tur. Uh, this is the Mount of Olives. Um, and then uh, he uh, continues to say, and he eats every Friday two meals. There's a truffles, uh, Arabic, uh, Arabic kama, and basil. So that was all what he would uh, uh, live on. And he drinks from Zamzam, that is the spring, uh, the, pump, the, the, uh, the holy spring in Mecca. And from the Jub Sulaiman, that is the system of Salomon, which is also uh, in the vicinity of the um, uh, Mosque. And he watches himself in Ein Silvan, the spring of Silvan, which uh, um, I think uh, we would call now, uh, it's called uh, the Gihon. Um. Now, on the Haram, you can see that we find now the dome of uh, Khidr. Here um, and also a black tile. It's called the um, Balat al Aswad. And this is um, some also considered the place uh, where Khidr would pray. Now, he is telling now the following story. He says, Abu Hafs al Homsi told the following So he, somebody came from, uh, came from Homs, uh, Syria, and he would say, uh, tell the following story. I entered the mosque in Jerusalem before noon time to pray there, and I heard a voice, sometimes low, sometimes loud, and it would say, and now I, 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 uh, this is a prayer of supplication, um, and I'll just read it in Arabic because it's, uh, first of all, it sounds better, second, it's difficult to, um, um, to translate, but uh, feel free to translate. 
So, Yarab, in the Fakir, but in the Khair of Sajir, Yarab, not to put the Ismi, Wala to Rayer Jismi, Wala to Jahel Bala. I got out terrified and went to the people at the entrance of the mosque and they asked me, Malak Ya so what's the matter with you? And he told them, and I told them about the altar, and they said, thank him for it. This is still a peace be upon him, and this is his time of prayer. So you can see there is the, the um, uh, we have the existence or the presence of, you know, the, the people, the, the people that can be seen and also people that can obviously just be heard. And Jerusalem is not just a place uh, of worship for Khidr, but for all prophets. So all prophets, he would say, would uh, turn their face to Jerusalem. So in Arabic, the, uh, uh, the direction of prayer is Qibla. And, and Qibla would be to the rock in the middle of the dome of the rock. And uh, everybody would do. Also, the Prophet and his community did so in the beginning for uh, a couple months. of months, 18 months. Um, and, um, and then it was actually an honor given from God to the Prophet that he could change the Qibla to the Qibla uh, of Mecca. This is uh, how he um, explains that. Now, um, and uh, you can see that here also. Hence, um, it is Kurashi uh, uh, actually remembers his readers that one of the best places to pray is actually if you would stay, if you actually look, um, if you would pray where the, uh, um, these domes are behind the Dome of the Rock because then you have both Kiblas that you can use and then you would uh, observe the Kibla that uh, would go uh, to, to Mecca but also the Kibla that would face uh, the Dome of the Rock. So he would say the best place to pray on, uh, on, on uh, inside uh, the Haram would be um, However, um, as I said, the Jerusalem plays a very big role in, in, the, in the life of the Prophet and also for the Muslim community. Um, for he went to Jerusalem uh, during the Isra and, and, uh, and would also do, uh, ascend to heaven and where you know, he would uh, meet different prophets and um, go uh, all the way up. Uh, to God. And what's interesting here is again also that he leads prayer. And you can see that in one of the um, um, manuscripts and depictions where the prophet is leading the prayer of the angels in Jerusalem when he's coming here. And this stone uh, that is now in the plaza uh, reminds, uh, is a reminder uh, of this heaven. Um, and then he quotes because how do the angels come uh, to this uh, to this place? He quotes a tradition saying there's an open gate in the heaven from the gates of paradise, from which tenderness and mercy, so Hanan and Rahma, descends unto Jerusalem until the day of resurrection. And the rain that falls on Jerusalem is a cure for all because it comes from the tenderness of paradise. So there is something that is open here. And there is an open gate at the lowest heaven from where 70,000 angels descend every night and they ask for forgiveness for each one who came to Jerusalem to pray. And then he retold the following story. One of the worshippers said, I was in the Vedan office and I prayed the night prayer, so the Sadat al and I took advantage of the column, of the columns inside the mosque, and the guard forgot me, and did not wake me up, and closed the doors. When I woke up from, uh, I woke up from the sound of wings of angels, and the mosque was filled in rows with angels. The one next to me said, are you a woman? I answered, I am. 
when I told him the story of me being still here. It is before, right? So I have heard one from the right side say, and again, this is now a glorification uh, of God, which also is um, the most part formulas from the Quran. So he would say, Subhan al Da'im al Da'im, Subhan al Da'im al Da'im, Subhan al Hayy al Hayy, Subhan al Wa Bihamdi, Subhan al Malik al Qudus, Wa al Malaik al Wal, Subhan al Alam, Subhan Hu wa Taala. And one from the left side said the same. I asked the one next to me. So this is called dua, right? So what uh, what is this? Uh, what I see? Who's the one on the left side? And the one next to him answered, this is Jibreel. And who's talking from the left side? He said, it's Mikael. I said, by God, who gave all this power that I see in this worship, what happens to the one who prays like that? So what happens to the one who would use the dua that uh, you hear right now, and he would uh, pronounce it himself? And so this angel answers him, whoever said this phrase one year, each day one time, he will not die unless he saw his place in paradise. Um, and Abu Zahiriya said, I might not live another year. So I sat in a place and said this uh, glorification uh, 360 times. And then I saw my place in paradise. Muqatil ibn Sulaiman, an early famous early Muslim exegete, also came to Jerusalem. Uh, in the 8th century, and the following story is retold in this book. He prayed, uh, he prayed, in, uh, and then sat down at one of the uh, columns of the Kibli uh, gate, as you can see. And the people around gathered uh, to learn and to listen from him. And then came a Bedouin, walking with very heavy steps over the tiles. You can see the tiles, he, he, he was very young. And Mokadil said to the people around him, hey, make space. Uh, get away from me, um, that I can see who's walking there. And then he saw the man and told him, hey, heavy walker, lighten your steps by the one who has my soul in his hands. You are stepping on the bricks of paradise. All around until the walls, there is no centimeter where not a chosen prophet has prayed or a righteous king to the and each night, 70,000 angels descend from heaven. So, as you can see, with these stories um, and explanations that are coming, actually, Karashi draws an image of a space filled with sanctity and with holiness. Hence, um, when he will now turn to the merits of Jerusalem in this world and for the world to come, this sanctity is the engine for people now to pray at certain places and a lot, to fast in Jerusalem, to ask for forgiveness for, um, for uh, the Muslim brothers and sisters, to give certain alms, to build public uh, buildings, to give oil to the mosque in, in order that, uh, that all the lights can be lighted all the time, uh, to build fountains uh, or give endowments. Uh, because of this holiness. A special holiness is attributed to the rock. Um, and this is uh, very interesting. What It's almost um, uh, mystical, a mystical love that he describes here. Because he says, uh, he says, God Almighty said to the rock of Jerusalem, whoever loves you, I will love him. And whoever lo loves you, loves me. Whoever hates you, I shall hate him. My eye is upon you from near to you. Who prays to Rakat on you? So Rakat is uh, the circle of uh, ritual prayer. So if you have circles, uh, who prays to Rakat will take away his sins, as when I took him out of his mother, except if he returns to his previous sinful life, and all will be the and the days and nights shall not pass until I gather all places of worship, so all the sages, in which the name of God is remembered around you, just like the procession of the bride who is surrounded until she reaches the home of the bridegroom. 
I sent a fire from the sky upon you to clean you from every foot who stepped on you and every hand that touched upon you. And I sent a dome of light that I formed with my own hands and that shines from the sky and the earth. I will set upon you a wall of gold, one of silver, one of pearls, and one of rubies, twelve miles thick. People will see the light of your dome from afar and will say, Bless the one who prays to Ragas in you. I promise to the one who is living in you that he will never in his life miss any blessing. Whoever dies in you dies as if he is in the first heaven, and whoever dies in your surroundings is as if he died inside you. One day in you is like 1,000 days, one month like 1,000 months, a year like 1,000 years. One good deed is like 1,000 good deeds, and uh, one bad is like 1,000. So, because of this holiness uh, and God's love and grace and tenderness that is given un, uh, unto the rock and unto uh, the whole mosque, a lot of miracles happened in the vicinity of the mosque and inside Jerusalem. And I uh, will just give you two examples uh, of a, lot, uh, a long list that he gives, uh, and one that I found very interesting. There is at one gate a wooden dock. Uh, and whenever someone passes him who knows magic, um, the dog will bark at him. And he will then forget all his magic and that he's capable of before he enters the mosque. So he still can enter, but he's free. Uh, he's not capable of doing any magic. This one and the other one, um, which is, I think, even uh, was more relevant to the people uh, until recent times. Whoever would go down to Einzel Wen and take a full bath would be relieved of all but any pain. So whoever would go down um, would recover. So if one does not settle in Jerusalem or the land around, but comes for a visit, he explains then which places he should uh, visit, uh, what prayers he should utter, and which rituals should be performed. And I just give you some examples that you might maybe not uh, be aware of. And of course, it's the rock and the tile, the kiblas. Then we have uh, the different uh, domes, like the Silsila dome that is related to uh, Salomo, the Gate of Mercy, uh, which you see here, um, which uh, is a mosque, uh, and uh, in Christian tradition is called the Golden Gate. Um, the Dome of the Prophet, um, uh, the place of the worship of Mary, so the Mehrab Mariam, which is underneath, that you see in the cradle of uh, Jesus. So here you also see uh, um, um, the importance of Mary and Jesus uh, and the knowledge uh, uh, of the of Christian traditions that, um, that can be found here, but that are also uh, indigenous uh, Muslim um, that, uh, that Mary was uh, living in the, in the temple and had uh, prayed there and uh, Jesus was also there. And then we also have outside uh, the, the, the mosque itself, he would uh, very much uh, talk about um, Mount of Olives to Zeta. Uh, and what can be seen there, the uh, graves of prophets, um, in the ascension uh, place of Jesus, um, and also uh, in Zedan. And then after that he has for each of these places certain to us, certain prayers that would be uttered um, at these locations. I hope this already uh, somehow gave you a glimpse um, about the wills traditions that uh, attracted pilgrims um, and believers to come to visit, to settle in the city, uh, and who were then also the patrons of certain buildings, uh, of many buildings, and who came to experience this kind of holiness, this proximity of, uh, of paradise uh, to Jerusalem. Now, Ali Plebo, a Palestinian historian, describes then in the, the 
the city in the 14th century, where this um, a little bit later than the, the book uh, I quoted from, he uh, describes one who chose them like that. Wealthy dowagers, emirs, and sultans are among the illustrious, pious philanthropists who bequeathed Jerusalem its magnificent or majestic edifices and grandiose facades. So all what you can see in the old Setunchuk, Tankis, Kalamun, Utvai, Barku, Barbakan, Baibars, Agun El Kamili, and others. A monthly array of personages that included slave traders, palace tutors, royal princesses from East and Central Asia, all seeking a safe haven, distant from Mongol invasion, penitent sisters from Maradi, Sufi friends in personal quest for their peace, and deposed princes searched for redemption in a Ashari. Each endowment has its story of love and hate, loyalty and treachery, fear and faith. Behind the exquisitely designed facades, they sought in a peace. Collection portals were doorways, personal redemption, and paradise. The sumptuously decorated first floor windows with iron grip bars were windows of grace. Their splendor, the constant Quranic recitation, and their sheer glorious disposition compelled the passerby to stop and read the Fatiha, uh, the first verse or the first word of the Quran. So he tries to, you know, somehow he gives the same kind of reflection that also a Tarashi uh, with his book um, kind of installed, I think, in us. Um, and uh, before we come back to these magnificent uh, buildings, I want to go outside uh, the Haram for a moment uh, and think about paradise which is always connected to death. Um, because if we get out of the haram, if we get out of the old city, when we turn our eyes, we are surrounded by graveyards. The Bab Rahna graveyard, the graveyard uh, in um, Bab Sahira, and Mamila, for example, to, say, to, to, to um, uh, refer to the um, Muslim uh, graveyards. So this city, Jerusalem, is actually a city that is shared by the living and the dead. And so the dead are not actually separated, they are actually sharing the same space and they stay connected. So death is part of life uh, as heaven uh, is uh, so close to the earth here. And hence the question raises how to integrate the dead in life. Which role play death in life? And what about the graveyard as a liminal space between their life and after afterlife? And again, also the proximity of paradise. So we have to think, and this is also what Al Karashi did. He was thinking about visiting graveyards. Should we do? Should we not do? How do we do that? So that was a theoretical divide made among our Muslim theologians for a long time, and again and again, uh, because uh, there was a certain danger uh, to visit. Dead, especially saints, um, that uh, that maybe would uh, be kind of intermediates between God and humans, and that would uh, that would be against the pure faith of Islam. However, Karashi really dedicates a long last chapter uh, on visiting graves, and he's very much in favor. Um, and I think so were Muslims in Jerusalem throughout centuries. He says, actually, when you are visiting graves, if you look, graveyards. Uh, so this is a uh, one is Barbara. This is from Barbara. Uh, also here, this is an old picture of uh, This is an old picture from Mamida, uh, and also uh, Mamida in the state mountains. So he would say. It has its merit, so it's also uh, it's a father to go there for that, because uh, it causes yes, it causes sadness, but it also can relieve from sadness and worries, because in a way you're confronted um, with the end of all things and that everything just uh, passes, and so 
he says, you are always reminded of the end of life and that there is the existence of an afterlife in Arabic, is the Akhir. Um, and that all uh, days are counted and, and we have to strive actually for the, for the days that will uh, be the remaining days, the, the days that Baki that stay. So if you visit graveyards, you, it will help you to refrain from luxury uh, and it will also direct oneself to restrain, to uh, kind of uh, asceticism. Um, he also says that whoever would visit the grave, evil, would not have no power over humans. So, um, so you are also in a safe zone, so to say. And it helped actually to train the nafs, so the kind of inner self, uh, to, to humiliate yourself in front of God, to be more submissive, what, what Islam actually means, submissive, uh, and to be patient to learn what is the term sabr uh, in, in Arabic. Um, and he said, it's also a deserted place such as a graveyard, it's a lonely place, and in lonely places you can find goodness. Uh, so the least actually one can do for the dead is actually to pray for them and to ask God to have mercy upon them. And in honoring the dead, blessing will be given to the visitors. So you have a twofold um, action. And he would say the prayers actually at the grave are more readily to be answered because actually of the, the, the person's humility at the, at the spot. Uh, when he's asking or she's asking and she's in, in, in the state of, of, of knowing of her limitations. And he argues, and that's uh, actually interesting, maybe, uh, that God is the vakir uh, of the dead, so kind of, I don't know, it's an attorney or representative or something of the absent. So somehow, if you are visiting the grave of, let's say, prophet and saints, uh, there is a very much, you're very much close to God who is also present there. And there's an opportunity for you uh, for the, the, the visitor to continue praying uh, that also uh, instead of the deceased. And um, so the dead would also pray for them and ask for mercy upon them. So God will grant mercy for the one who was prayed for and also the one praying. And he would say the deceased are now in the presence of God and they would be, as he would say, guests of God, do you? And God would be a very generous host, so uh, and He would like to take care of His guests. So if uh, people are uh, so saints and prophets are in paradise and they would ask something, uh, the host would not say no. So they are kind of delegation, and they can have requests uh, and they will be answered. So He said, "I have never seen anyone." who was dedicated to visiting funerals and graves without witnessing a grace from God. Um, so grace is karama, it's kind of also miracles. Uh, bestowed upon him at his death when visiting his grave. Let the one who visits the prophets and saints know that they are the true kings and that they observe the visitor when he's entering their house. And let him know, so the visitor, that they observe him with their eyes closed and they answer him in their silence. So we have on the one side that he says that, that they are still present, he's kind of that the, the, the dead, and, and they observe, and he also says that God is also present instead uh, of, of, of these holy uh, people. Um, one tradition uh, that was actually kept until uh, recent times, and I think just diminished um, in, in maybe, um, frequently is that people went actually to the graveyards and they were distributing food. But uh, you might, uh, may maybe it's still, you still do it. Um, uh, I wouldn't uh, really know. So there is actually a, a tradition that uh, you would distribute food to the poor and to the children in the memory of the deceased. And this uh, usually consisted of dry food and a special bread. And you see here, this is a bread stamp 
from um, Mamluk times. Uh, that uh, so it's like a hat, it's small breads that were um, it, it called was called Kakel Asfar, so the yellow bread. Uh, and it was intended for the souls of the departed. So may the um, the memory be a blessing. So um, we, there is still some, uh, um, the, 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 there is still kind of bread that is still Muhammad. So it's still uh, distributed. Uh, I don't know whether the following tradition still exists, but existed throughout centuries. This is that on the Thursday, the Khamis al Amwat, which is um, um, between the Catholic and the Orthodox Easter, uh, Muslim women would go out to the cemetery before sunrise. They would pray there and distribute this kind of bread uh, and dried fruit and also painted eggs. Um, or, and, and especially children would come and also ask for the eggs. So this also underscores that Jerusalem is always a, a, a space of cohabitation, always a space where people interact, uh, religious communities uh, live together and they share um, certain traditions and have shared customs all the, uh, all the way actually to food practices. Um, I want to give you some uh, idea about the importance of graveyards, um, specifically uh, Manila, because it's such a deserted place nowadays, but it used to be uh, the most prominent and the biggest uh, Muslim cemetery uh, in, uh, in, the, in the city. Um, and to show you, um, it's, it's, it's a miserable state now. Um, but there was actually uh, the, one of the roads coming from Jaffa to Jaffa Gate uh, went through uh, through uh, Mamela Cemetery, and so that was always an opportunity also for people to go visit the graves. And there were certain graves uh, that were considered holy or uh, tombs of holy people, of saints, um, of Awiya. Um, that would be visited and uh, there were certain blessings and also miracles that happened there. Um, and the, maybe you know that if you still, you still uh, can pass it, there is the Kubakia. Uh, uh, this is uh, the only actually surviving Mamluk uh, structure that we have outside the old city. This is a uh, kind of turba, a mausoleum, and inside you have a uh, tomb. Um, and this is actually, he was an officer, uh, this, 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 this. Yes, right, it's Fat al Halab. Uh, and actually there is um, Mujaraddin, who wrote his biography about the city, he called this structure uh, Zawid al Kubakir, which uh, Zawi is always uh, a place where uh, Sufis uh, um, gather, so obviously um, this, this was a place where uh, mystics gathered for prayers in, in his times. Um, and at the tombstone, uh, tombstone uh, stone would uh, say the following, in the name of God, the merciful and the compassionate, and his blessings upon his prophet Muhammad and his family. This is the grave of the servant to God Almighty, Prince Ala Abdin, Aiduri ibn Abdullah, known as al Qubaki, who died Friday the 5th of uh, the month of Ramadan in the year 688, so 1289. God covered him in his mercy and set him in the Garden of Eden. So here you can see this uh, very strong belief uh, that uh, Qubakiya is already in paradise, that paradise is already, you know, available for uh, certain people, which also makes the space of the Kubakia so special because of the closeness of the deceased uh, to God. And then we have another one. This is the uh, grave of al Qurayshi. Um, he came actually from Spain to Jerusalem and died there in 1202. Um, and he was a very famous Sufi intellectual of his time. And he was believed to have a lot of healing powers, and he ran a zawiya, 
uh, saw a place called Structures and Rituals for Sufis, uh, with around 600 students and followers at this time. And I think this uh, talk is uh, very uh, special. It says, Sheikh Abdullah al Qureshi, that is, uh, we spawned the source uh, of miracles. Uh, and he points to the time of the leader of all saints, so I'm not sure uh, what that means. So the Sheikh al Awliya, um, whether this is a special uh, person of the Sufi, um, uh, Sufi Tariqa. His grave, grave is near Vital Maqdis in a place called Mamilla, where the line of compassion descends day and night. Now, it's not clear with, whether this light is sending out to the Nakis to the mosque or maybe also to Manila itself. He who has established his holy place uh, at Babala is the right for king. So he actually, uh, in, through his life, and uh, um, he's already in a, uh, in a close place uh, to God. In his past, in this world, the king produced beautiful things, so he did a lot of miracles. And there is, and I already said that there is a historiography also actually by Mujeruddin um, uh, uh from the uh, 16th century. Uh, he wrote a book about Jerusalem, and whoever studies uh, archaeology uh, always have. Uh, Islamic archaeology will always refer to this book because he very precisely um, describes all the places uh, in his lifetime uh, of Jerusalem. And he also writes in length about Mamila. And he says the following In the middle of the cemetery is a Zabra, a building which, uh, which is called the Kalandaria, with large buildings. The Zawiya used to be a church from the Byzantine times that was called the Red Monastery, Deradani, and Christians were still attached to it. A man called Sheikh Ibrahim al Kalandari came to Jerusalem and established a community of poor people who resided there and who were called after him, al Kalandari. During his lifetime lived also Situnchuk al Muzaffariya, and she built a grand house known as Dar Sit on the Hill, which is near Baba Naza. One of the gates uh, to the mosque, and she favored Sheikh Ibrahim, so she was in favor of this uh, Sufi. She commissioned in the aforementioned Zawiya a well structured dome above the grave of her brother Bihadr, and it still exists today. She also commissioned the courtyard around it. This was built in 794, that is uh, uh, 1392. She's buried in her turba in the mausoleum that she prepared at the uh, Akaba, sit opposite of the grand house. May God have mercy on her and her body. What you can see here is that um, this, uh, that the graveyard is not just uh, a place where uh, the dead people are buried, but also where people then started to live and have, because of their vicinity to to, uh, um, to this uh, disease and, and uh, the vicinity to, to the idea of afterlife, that you have these Sufis, these mystics that would also settle there and um, uh, and have the, the rituals and the practices there, and uh, also the yeah the thinking and theology. Um, and we don't have any of uh, what he described, the Kalandaria, nothing of this uh, is left, so we don't know whether, where this was. What is interesting is that he's talking about the women, if you may have noticed, so sit Tunchu. And this is the, so here we go back to the old city, and also this is our last uh, step today. We go to her big and um, huge uh, residence. And No, still not. So, uh, so uh, Mujahideen was very impressed, and I think so. Uh, uh, we today we pass uh, this residency that um, she built. This was built in the late uh, 14th century, uh, and in that time it had a direct view 
uh, onto the dome of the rock, and it's actually one of its kind. And it would, was very impressive that, uh, that also legal documents from that time would call the full um, area the top of the city, so the Ladies' Hill. Um, and uh, so you can, you can see that. Uh, so this is the residence. Um, and in this residence you have two floors. In the uh, lower floor you have stables and you have like a um, uh, room where people can be uh, received. Um, and a uh, reception hall and on the upper floor you have around 20 rooms. And now, what's important, and we'll see in a moment, is that uh, not just that you have to think about how did you use such a huge, huge residency, um, uh, one of the answers that you can maybe find is in uh, a description that we have uh, that you which uh, runs around the window that you can see. Uh, it's not very wet. Uh, and this is a long um, uh, uh, quotation from the Quran. And maybe, maybe this is also how she understood uh, her life, how she wished to um, experience this world, this um, also uh, her sense of life. So it is actually from Surah the Hijr, this is the 15th Surah, and it goes like that. Enter them, these are, they then are the uh, gardens of paradise, in peace and security. We shall strip away all the bitterness that is in their breasts. As brothers, they shall be upon couches face to face. No fatigue shall ever touch them there, neither shall they ever be driven out from there. Tell my servants that I am the old living, the old confessional, and that my punishment is the painful punishment. And tell them of the guests of Abraham, when they entered unto him, saying, Peace. He said, Behold, we fear you. They said, Don't be afraid. We give you good tidings of the knowledge of the boy. He said, Do you give me good tidings? The old age has smitten me. Of what do you give good tidings? They said, We give good tidings in truth. Do not be among those who despair. Said, who despairs of the mercy of this Lord, excepting those that are afraid. Now, the verses that you, as you can maybe have heard, are described that tranquility God bestows on the faithful in paradise, so that they be in peace and security, they be like brothers upon couches um, uh, facing one another. Um, they proclaim the Rahma, the divine grace and also God's planted justice. And then the remaining uh, verses are the verses of the visit of the heavenly uh, envoys to Abraham. Now, all these features are somehow also reflecting divine and human hospitality. So that um, these, the guests of God who will dwell in the gardens and uh, the guests that are coming to Abraham, uh, and he wants actually to uh, show them hospitality, and by showing that he gets afraid because they don't want to eat what they are, uh, they are offered, uh, and then they announce that he will uh, get a son. Now, maybe this uh, residence is not a residence to show off um, uh, her, her wealth. But maybe she offered hospitality to pilgrims, food, a place to stay, in the hope of receiving uh, eternal and divine hospitality um, in light of the blessing that people would give um, dwelling around the Haram and the blessings that would be given to her through her actions. And this is actually uh, interesting to see if you see on the very opposite side. So we have uh, 
the residents here on the opposite side is the Turba, the Suko, the Sok, and the Mau uh, Mausoleum. So the, the grave of Sutunchuk um, that, uh, that you can see and that faces this inscription that somehow maybe mirrors uh, her expectation. Um, uh, so the windows, if you have it still in mind, is something very peculiar. Usually we don't have windows at this height because you can look inside. But for uh, these kind of tools, this is normal that you can look inside, you see the tomb. Um, and uh, inside this room where you have the tomb in the middle, you have uh, usually a place uh, for a Quran reciter, a party, who would at certain uh, times in the week uh, would read the Quran. And uh, reading the Quran is a blessing and listening to the Quran is a blessing. So even in her death, um, somehow Sertunchu, um, with this mausoleum, uh, tries not just to bring blessings upon the people who are passing, but also uh, in receiving blessings by the bypassers who would, uh, in the best case, uh, uh, not just pass, but look, uh, read the Fatiha, so uh, pray for her and pray, uh, pray for her blessings. So, um, and also the building of the Turba inside that has other um, rooms that might have been gathering places for religious groups, for group, uh, uh, that maybe held uh, certain uh, rituals in her memory. Now, today this is actually a uh, rather quiet street, but um, I wish, uh, I to the end, I wish I could show you that there is this kind of liminality in uh, Jerusalem. Um, and uh, when I come with Muslim friends, family, to usually it's Damascus Bait, uh, they usually do, they sigh very deeply. And then I say, what's the matter? And they say, there's something. There is something that is transformative about this place. There is something that elevates um, uh, me uh, and, and, and makes uh, changes me here. So um, I, I hope that this power of transformation can actually still billow out, uh, billow out into this um, uh, blessed land and uh, hope that you all can maybe, um, in this or that way, experience her life also in Thank you for listening. Questions? Comments? Comments, yes, comments, please. You should, of course, thank you for this uh, wonderful lecture. I would like to mention I don't know you know you have a lot but for the people in that. Yes. Did you do any research regarding the This is the road that would go from Jaffa Gate to uh, the Haram, to the, and, and this is also filled with a lot of turbas. Um, and and that, that gives you a feeling how important it was to be buried there and to, um, and to pass. Now, uh, what you're referring to is this kind of holy saints, whatever, that are disputed and that that they would say this is uh, another person that is uh, buried there, it's not the one that, for example, the Muslim tradition would have. 
Um, this happens, I think, not just there. No, not, not only actually. Not the first visits for Okasha. Okasha he was a companion uh, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Some other uh, groups will tell you not only Okasha is buried there, also Muhammad, Isa, and Musa. And that's why they call that street Prophet Sorrow comes from this. For the image, they were looking like a famous street. I was excited to know a few prophets are buried here, so let's call it Prophet Sorrow at the British Monday. Okay. Actually, I'm not, I, I, I really am not aware of that. I know about the Sahaba graves in Bab Rahma and Salman al Farsi on, uh, yeah. So, yeah, but uh, he who told us some more information. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your research. You are very important, you are very important. Uh, I started thinking all the way through you, 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 this presentation that uh, to what extent you have established this research on the Quran Kiri, Muhammad's Quran Kiri. On the, on the Quranic uh, yes. verse? To what extent you have established this research on the Muqaddas Quran Kiri? Because I didn't hear you saying that this surah, this chapter, says this and that, you know, in order to prove your viewpoint. Which, what do I have to prove? Just... Your research. That is based on the Quran? Yes. Because this is the law of the Lord, and you are to be closely related to Quran okay? The truth is how you to do the Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. It's interesting. Um, so the, uh, um, what we have in the Quran is the, the, the relation, the, is the references to the land, to the whole, to the blessed land, right? And the, um, and, um, and, and the reference to the night journey. Now, uh, for Islamic uh, theology, uh, the Quran is the main, let's say, this is the, uh, the, the speech of God, but what is also important is what the Hadith say, so what the Prophet said. Uh, and now a lot of the traditions that relate to Jerusalem are not based on the Quran, but they are Hadith, right? So if I want to establish any kind, and, and this is what actually the, Fada, the authors of the Fada'il did, is they use Quranic verses, and, and actually al qadashi uses a lot of them, um, but they also use um, the, the um, traditions that are referring to the Prophet, because they would say that is eagerly of importance uh, when we talk about Jerusalem. So it, it, it needs these two, so not just the Quran. certain space and that is always also connected to politics and whatever it comes to. 
uh, and to certain maybe also strands in uh, um, theological thinking. Uh, but what I said, and I usually because I'm, I'm more into uh, history, uh, I'm not. Uh, I don't. Um, I'm not an anthropologist to, to know. But of what I know, this kind of uh, experiencing uh, this power this is is all the way there. And uh, I think we, what I imagine, is to give more space to this kind of um, uh, experiences. Uh, and also to be aware that uh, what I said in the beginning, you know, usually you come and you look at, at the structure, but you don't look at what people are doing uh, and how they connect to the place and uh, what, uh, how, which kind of stories come. And, and the stories that I gave you, I think maybe most of Muslims would not know them, but a lot of them are very well known. They're just not known to, to people who are not coming from an Islamic background. And, and to be aware of this importance that, uh, that Jerusalem has in uh, Muslim mindset, I think it's important just to, first of all, to, to recognize. Those of you that may have driven out, um, there are two people that came 